All right, all right. Welcome everyone to episode 56, live from my drum room. Um, got a great show today. Um, this is part three of Remembering Charlie Watts. Um, you Hopefully you've seen parts one and two. I've had some tremendous guests on both of those shows, and I've got some really great guys today with me uh, in the waiting room right now. And hopefully a couple more are going to join sort of uh, in progress, but if not, you won't be disappointed with today's guests, who are Simon Kirk, the legendary Simon Kirk from Bad Company and Free, uh, my old buddy Greg Bissonette, Ringo Starr's um, current drummer, been his drummer for the past 13 years, and uh, another old buddy, Steve Gorman of the Black Crows, and uh, Trigger Hippie, and and uh, you know a million other things. So they're uh, waiting in the in the uh, in the green room. But uh, thank you for tuning in. I do want to mention uh, to check out all these other episodes on my YouTube channel and to subscribe. I appreciate that. And what else can I tell you? Um, also available as, as podcasts. And uh, also check out the episode I did last week with Richard King, who uh, was a friend of Charlie's as well and you know provided a lot of Charlie's vintage drum equipment throughout the years. And, uh, and that was a great episode too. And we're going to do a part two uh, of that uh, part of it, and, you know, Charlie's equipment and talking about Charlie's drums. But this is part three of remembering Charlie with a, a whole bunch of his friends. So thanks for joining. And without further ado, I'm going to welcome my esteemed guests. Uh, let's see, I'm going to admit them all at the same time. So welcome Simon Kirk, Steve Gorman, and Greg Bissonette. Okay, gents, yeah. we are, uh, all right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, guys. Hey, Johnny. Thanks for joining. Hi, Greg. <laughs> Simon, Thanks Steve. Having, yeah, Thrilled thank you for here. being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start off by saying, just by coincidence, you know, when we set this date up a couple of weeks ago, I didn't realize it, but... Um, Five years ago today, I had this amazing uh, memory or day with Charlie. They played a private show for the New England Patriots football team, uh, the owner, Bob Kraft, at Gillette Stadium. And it was like 200 people invited. They had a tent midfield, and uh, Charlie invited me out to the show. And it was, uh, you guys know from doing private shows, it's a whole different world as far as um, – just, I, you know, the sort of looseness of it, I guess you could say. And uh, it's it's one of my best memories of spending time with Charlie because he was just so chill and relaxed. And, uh, you know, there was there was sort of uh, no demands on his time, so to speak. So he, I kept thinking, I, you know, I was in his way and I should leave his dressing room and, and let him get ready for the show. And he's, and he's like, I've got nothing to do. You you don't have to go. <laughs> he loved you, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh -huh. well, I I loved him too. He was he was so amazing. But um, anyway, I, I I put something up on Facebook because it just happened to be the same day five years ago. And wow. well, the, I, the last time I saw Charlie, I, it was all I was like, I'm a friend of John DeChristopher's. You know, it's one of those <laughs> you got to throw your name out, and then suddenly it's all cool. <laughs> oh, that's that's too funny. Uh, and I and I was saying uh, before we started recording that I, I Simon I had the honor of meeting you nine years ago. We just were saying at mm -hmm. a Stone show in New Jersey, and, uh, right. and I knew you guys were were old friends. And I'd I'd love to hear the history of you guys because I just the other day downloaded the super deluxe version of Tattoo You. Uh huh. Came out forty years ago. That's and, yeah. That's really when I I mean I I obviously known. Uh, I known them because of my relationship with Ronnie. I mean, uh, Free and the Faces toured together in 71. I, it's a very blurred memory, I have to tell you. Um, but when when Ronnie joined the Stones in 75, you know, you know um, by osmosis, I became friendly, you know, with, with Keith uh, and, and Charlie. Um, mm. And, of course, I, I've always been a huge fan of Charlie's. Um, and I was a little nervous about him, even though Ronnie was saying, look, he's the nicest guy on the planet. He's so quiet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
but it wasn't until I went over to Paris um, to hang out with Ronnie and when they were doing Tattoo You. And, and Charlie was so nice because immediately when I went into the, the, the studio at sort of two in the morning, that's when they started, mm. two in the morning, can you believe it? And poor Charlie, you know, he was he was the uh, the relatively sober one of the group. And um, they would go from two in the morning until two in the afternoon, completely <laughs> at odds of what you and me and Greg and Steve are, are used to. But he said, look, I've got some new gear. And I, I must have said somewhere, I, I remember saying in an interview years before that, you know, Charlie always used that same lovely old round badge uh, Gretsch kit, which I believe he'd had since 62 or 63. And he never seems to get any new gear. And he said here, and he kind of almost dragged me into the drum room saying, look, I've got some new gear, I've got some new gear. And I'm looking at this kit and saying, what the fuck, Charlie? It's the same bloody kit that you've had for 30 years. This is in, um, I think, 89 or so a little less than 30 years. He said, no, look closely. I've got a new drum head and a new pair of sticks. <laughs> and, 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 and he's serious. I mean, he's dead serious. And I said, oh, great, Charlie. Well, you know, you didn't break the bank uh, upgrading your kit very much. And then I see this confetti that's, you know, in all the hoops. And any good drummer uh, like this trio before me, like so a clean kit because it makes the drums sound great la 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 and charlie says oh no that's from the from the dragon that we used to have on the 71 to a spewing confetti you know <laughs> during <laughs> during satisfaction and uh, it's, been, it's been there for for 20 i think 26 years simon yeah i think so uh, <laughs> but uh, that was yeah, that was my first real intro to Charlie, and then uh, oh, I really yeah. love the guy. He's a great. You guy. know, I, I, it reminds me his his right. former tech Chooch, who was with him for yeah, uh, Chooch. Yeah, uh, we did some gigs with the Stones in '95, and you know that first day, I go up to look at the kit like every drummer ever <laughs> Stones does. You just stand oh, yeah. for it, you know. And his throne, um, the 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 legs and the stand of his throne, there was just this big wonky globby <laughs> <laughs> section. <laughs> and I looked at it and Chooch saw me note it. And he goes, that thing, that thing finally fell apart and Charlie wouldn't let me replace it. I had to get a guy to come up with like a soldering gun and a welding mask and <laughs> just fix it as is, you know, he couldn't uh, get a new base to his throne. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, yeah, and I'm, yeah. You know, I'm like looking at this stadium in Switzerland going, just didn't <laughs> pop for the new throne. Huh? Okay. All right. Yeah. You know. uh, but I mean, there's so many of those stories, and obviously they're all true because everybody's got one about him never changing a damn thing. Yeah, well, he didn't. He wasn't that sort of guy, and yet, and yet, he was quite a prolific spender when it came to clothing. I mean, we all know he was one of the probably the best dressed drummer in history. I mean, you'd have to go back to the the 30s and 40s to, you know, people like Elvin Jones and you know the, the Philly yeah. Joe when they would wear those wonderful, you know, black tie. Charlie always dressed so beautifully, uh, and even his stage clothes were just these sort of pale slacks and grey uh, t-shirt. But off stage, he dressed so beautifully and cards. And I got a great story that Ronnie told me, and I, I wish I could have been there. But when he uh, he visited Charlie, stayed for a couple of nights in Charlie's house in the west west country of, of England. And halfway through the dinner, Charlie said, oh, I've got a new car. And, and Ronnie said, well, great. Well, let's go and see it, Charlie. All right. So after dessert, Charlie disappeared and he came back down about 10 minutes later, dressed in this sort of driving outfit from the 30s with gauntlets and buttons down, you know, like a double fronted chauffeur's outfit almost. And he said, well, come on then. So they, they go through the house and into the garage and there's this beautiful black Lagonda. It was in like 1938 Lagonda, beautiful. So they all get in it and they sit there looking at the smelling the leather and looking at the fascia and the whole thing. And Ronnie says, well, come on then, Charlie, let's go. And Charlie says, oh, yeah, I can't drive. <laughs> I just bought it because I like it. So... They just sat there making these sort of brum brum sounds. And then after 10 minutes, they got out and went back and had dessert. But, <laughs> but he got dressed up to show him. You dressed yeah. up to show him, Greg. Yes. 
That was Charlie. Oh, uh, I've heard I've heard stories like that, Simon. Yeah, I've, that that he would go out and just and sometimes just by himself, just sit in the car and just feel like oh. he was back in 1937. You know, okay. just yeah, yeah. I've I've heard that. It's it's. Wasn't he, was, he deep into buying horses as well? His yeah, wife. His, yeah, they they bought Arabian horses and, and bred them. And there's a great shot, I believe, from Vanity Fair from about 20 years ago. <laughs> Charlie, he said, we had these fucking horses in the living room. <laughs> these two beautiful white Arabian, must, whatever you call them, I don't know, geldings. And he said everything was great until they started firing away with, with these strobes. And then they just dumped a you know, huge horse turd. Oh on the my person, God. on the person. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh man! Now, that was Shirley, not Charlie. But uh, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. That uh, she didn't really come out on the road. You, you got to remember that Charlie was, by his own accounts, totally, totally faithful. Unlike other members of that band, which shall remain uh, anonymous, but he was totally faithful. He was the first one to be married. I believe he was the oldest of the band. He was born in 1940, uh, 41. So he was the oldest. And, you know, and all the others in the band adored him. I mean, I've never heard a bad word said about Charlie. And, and in conversation with Keith, who doesn't suffer fools gladly, uh, Mick, I mean, obviously Ronnie, because they were only separated by a day. Their birthdays mm -hmm. were only a day apart. But Ronnie was born in 47. They all adored uh, Charlie because he was so patient, you know. He says to me one day, he says, I've got the world record for holding a piss. And I went, well, that, that got my attention. He said, yeah, well, <laughs> 18 hours. And they were doing the tattoo album and, of course, you know, they didn't get started till sort of dawn. And Charlie's sitting there, always the first one behind the kit, twiddling his sticks. He could do yeah. that, Greg, like you do so well. He yeah. could do all that. He, I can't I do it with both hands. I could never do that. He did it while talking, you know. And he sat there for 18 hours and he said, I every time I got up to go for a piss, Mick would say, one, two, three, four. <laughs> bloody hell. So eventually, you know. Mick went out to do something. Charlie scurries away to the uh, to the toilet, and Mick walks in and says, "Where's the fucking drummer?" Oh no! Oh come on! Eighteen hours. <laughs> oh man! Uh, oh Charlie. Uh, well, Simon, yeah. I have to tell you. So uh, on that that deluxe version of uh, of Tattoo You that that was just released, mm -hmm. there's a version of Start Me Up, which was called Never Stop. It yeah. started off as a as a reggae song, yeah. And sure enough, now you're listed as playing percussion on it. Yeah, I still get checks. <laughs> I was getting all these checks from SAG AFTRA, and um, I I couldn't figure out for the life of me. You know, and being an honest gentleman, uh, you know, I started. I called SAG AFTRA. I said, "Look, I'm keep, I keep getting these checks." And they said, "Well, yeah, it's a recording session in Paris, uh, the Warner Pathé Studios at the Rolling Stones." And I remember playing congas. You know, I'm a very basic conga player, but Charlie said, "Listen, why don't you, you know, play congas on this?" And I didn't even know what the song was, John. Quite honestly, oh, my but it, it ended up being um, the, an alternate version of "Start Me Up," and it was such a yeah. simple pattern. But uh, no, I, I cashed the checks very quickly. I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, I always thought you played the claves on All Right Now, but you told me that was Paul Rogers. Paul Rogers, absolutely. I remember it to this day, yeah. You were Paul. just sitting out there in front of you clicking the claves. Huh? I was doing, uh, I think I was playing maracas and Paul was doing the claves. Uh, Paul's a very good drummer, by the way. Paul oh, is, is that right? Drummer. He's a very good, great, great feel, great, uh, great tempo and feel. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, we yeah. Well, you're wow. you're a very good singer. Simon, you I got to say, I've I've seen you sing in Ringo's All Star Band, and yeah, you're yeah. a fine singer. Thank you, thank you. I as, try. Yeah, yeah. As as is young Greg over there too. Oh, did your solo Hinkley. albums, Simon? Yeah. Or you did start a song? I know, <laughs> I know. What the hell? It's you know, just because I used it 50 years ago it doesn't mean it's that the I use it again. <laughs> That's right. You own that. But I, I want to I just talk, talk for a moment. 
You know, back in the day when when I was coming up, obviously I was a generation behind the Stones, and I'd never seen a drummer play with the jazz grip. Mm. It was always the match. You know, the Searchers, Dave Clark Five, Jerry and the Pacemaker. No one played with this jazz grip. And I'm trying to remember the first song I ever heard of the Stones. We, we, there was a, a TV program called Thank Your Lucky Stars. And it was, um, the, the Stones came on and uh, Charlie was doing, dunk, 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 you know, the Bo Diddley beat. Oh, yeah. Not Fade Away, um, probably. And, yeah. And I've never, never seen that beat. But he was leaning over to his right, obviously, because he's a right-handed player, playing the floor, Tom. And he had this weird, I've never seen this jazz grip before. And and I don't think he ever changed. It, maybe he got tired during a session or two. He might have switched the match. But every time I ever saw him, and I'm sure Greg and Steve would agree, he played that match grip, um, uh, the, the jazz grip. Yeah. And he got that wonderful slap. He, I mean, his backbeat, um, and I've made a note of Harlem Shuffle, you listen to the snare on Harlem Shuffle, it's a mile wide. It's yeah, yeah, because he hit it dead center, no rim shots. Uh, he wasn't even an inch off the dead center. And you look at his snare head, it had that sort of gray, you know, two inch <laughs> diameter yeah. mark where Charlie just hit it dead center every time. His backbeat was second to none, really. Wow, yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that song and and. <clears throat> I hope Charlie will forgive me for saying this. When that record came out in the 80s, I was mm. kind of like, uh, you know, being a, the fan that I was, I didn't I didn't dig that record a whole lot. I just kind of felt like it 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 wasn't well, it was a cover. Of, yeah, you know, yeah. It was a cover and the Stones were guilty in inverted commas of of tipping their hat to their, you know, their influences yeah. etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Sure. I never thought it should have been a single, uh, quite honestly. It was a great album track, but it, you know, it was, uh, it became this, uh, you know, one of their hits. Uh, yeah. Even yeah. It wasn't the song. Well, you know, after, after Charlie passed away, they were playing the Rolling Stones had their own channel on Sirius um, XM radio, you know, the satellite station or uh, radio network had a devoted Stones channel oh. for a few, couple of weeks like a limited time and they were playing that song a lot they were sort of looping a lot of the same songs but i heard mm -hmm. that song a lot and i i kind of went what was i thinking for that exact reason you said simon i'm like man his fucking backbeat is oh, just no. ridiculous in this song like how did i how did i overlook that and and think that it maybe it was the video that i saw that i thought seemed a little cheesy or something in the uh, 80s you know what i mean but it but it's such a I mean, he never really, you, I mean, Greg, I mean, he, you bring his, your left hand back 24, 36 inches to deliver. I mean, you're, you're a powerful drummer. I'm a powerful drummer. I know you are, Steve, but Charlie. Super, he, super powerful, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Charlie, I mean, it barely went past his nose. Right. Yeah. I mean, he yeah, just right. flipped it. This, this Bruce Lee one inch punch thing, you know. Yeah, the Bruce Lee. <laughs> oh, you yeah. never hit the rim shots. It was it really is. Middle, right when you yeah. saw him, Simon? Say again. Uh, you, you never hit the rim shots off the, you know, the middle rim and the hook. It was always. No, middle, huh? it always dead center. I mean, I, he could have done if he wanted. He just had right. that, that eccentric. Mm -hmm. And I saw him at a private event at the Hard Rock in Vegas. We all went out there. Um, and you're you're right, John. It's it's obviously you know we've all done corporate events, and and there are pluses and minuses. The the plus was they got two and a half million dollars cash, and they had Robin <laughs> Williams opening for them. That was fun. Uh, the, the I mean the downside was there were three hundred drunken. Uh, I think it was Dell Computers or one of those internet uh, firms, and they didn't go on till sort of midnight, so everyone was well out of it, and um, I, they couldn't care two hoots that the stones were on stage but yeah for an hour and a half and they played a stripped down set i got to see the stones up close and personal and i saw charlie from about 20 feet away as opposed to the stadium gigs where not only is he only an inch high but his backbeat is three seconds after he's hit the drum Right. And you know, yeah. that's so annoying. Oh, it is. Uh, yeah. But to be yeah. able to see Charlie so uh, up close 
Um, it, it, it was it was wonderful, and he barely broke a sweat. I don't think I ever saw him sweat, whereas I sweat buckets after three songs. He just had this very implacable way of playing, and also the famous do do back to do do, you know, lifting up of the right hand. Uh, and I said, where the fuck did that come from? He says, oh, Keith, he writes these bloody fast songs and I can't keep up. He did this song, Shattered. Do, 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 shattered, shattered. Do, do. And it's the only way I could keep up. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, okay, it works. I mean, you know, I mean, I, when in 95, again, you know, we did a, a European tour with them and, and, and we got to stand right behind him. There was a black scrim that from the audience just was like a black wall. But if you were behind it, you could look right out and see everything. You know, it was almost like a two-sided mirror the way it worked. Yeah. Um, and so we were standing, you know, Pierre, Keith Tech and Chooch were like, yeah, come up tonight, you know, a couple different nights. And we'd be five feet behind his kit. I mean, right behind him. Oh, and man. I remember the first time doing that, it was... I, I, it was like when you see someone who's seven feet tall, like it just doesn't compute right away. Like <laughs> yeah. and, and watching the, the ferocity of his yes. play. I mean, I've been, a, I've listened to Stones records my whole life. I've, re, I've taken everything I could from Charlie. I've done, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a student of, of those records and his playing and all that. And I was not prepared for what it was like to be so close to him. Cause as you said, he's, First of all, mild mannered. He's tiny. Well, I'm six three. He looks like I could just throw him over my shoulder, you know, that, <laughs> twice. Good, yeah. And and like you said, that stick is hitting the dead center of that drum. You can see the marks. There's just basically one real mark because right. that's all he ever hits. Right. And it it you know, and I am a I, I hit really hard, but that changed everything. I mean, I literally approached drumming differently from that day forward, hmm. and it was more about just efficiency with, you know, how do I, how do I play as hard, but with but just more focused, you know, it really, I, I, I said then that Bruce Lee one inch punch thing, it was right. just this phenomenal, uh, you know, I'm not surprised he waited 18 hours to take a leak because all I kept coming away with was the, fo it was like watching a guy play chess. Like he was so there, he was so completely present and he had to be because alive, especially those songs are flying. Yeah. You know, because yeah. Mick doesn't want to groove. He wants to rock and he wants to get 80,000 people excited and they have to be up yeah. tempo. And I just, yeah. it, it, it really, uh, there's just no way to, and the whole band sounds like a tornado, but it was Charlie. I mean, it was like that guy. Yeah. And I'm standing there going, how on earth is this guy doing what he's doing? Right. Besides, well, this right hand thing is amazing that you just told us because if that really came out, like you said, of him just wanting a break and his his hand was getting tired, that's exactly what you told me about how you came up with the 40th take on all right now playing quarter notes. I said, What a quarter notes. Yeah. Like, you know, quarter notes. You said, We did so many takes, I just wanted a break, right? Well, yeah, I, the, didn't know that. I wow. mean, we, we could do a little side by it, but I, I found that playing eight. When I, when I initially played all right now, after not only was it tiring after uh, four or five takes, but it was a different groove. It was more of a, a pressured type groove. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do, bom, 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 it just swings. It's it swaggers a little more, and 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 that's you know that, that's why uh, it morphed into that four on the on the hi hats and now someone told me that charlie uh, borrowed this particular style way back in the late 60s from jim keltner where he lifted the mm -hmm. right hand on the two you know uh, yeah. i i don't know i i just remember charlie telling me that when keith wrote shattered um that that's in, in order to keep up that's what he did I might be wrong, but it, 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 and I do it now. I mean, if I'm if I'm playing a really fast tempo, and it's quite easy to do. We're pretty coordinated, us drummers. Yeah. But um, it's it's the Charlie Watts uh, handoff. That's what I yeah. call it. It's, I saw uh, Steve Jordan play last week with. with oh yeah, and he he really honored Charlie with that. He really oh. did that. Almost well, where did you see him? 
I saw him at the new SoFi Stadium where the Rams play. My friend that I went to high school and college with and was in Maynard Ferguson's oh, back with has been playing Tim. sax with them for about the last 25 years. Tim Reese, and he got uh, my son and I, right. and my daughter and I had tickets, and we hung out, and it was so cool. And Tim told me, I didn't know this, Tim said that when – when uh, Keith was putting together the expensive winos, Charlie had said, you know, who'd be a great drummer for your band is Steve Jordan. Wow. Yeah. That's right. He was also, you know, need, uh, needing a sub. He, he yeah. also threw in Steve's name again. He was the perfect guy to do it because he played so much with Keith. And Yeah, anyway, true, yeah. true. Anyway, it was I a think great show. And the whole beginning was a great uh, memorial to Charlie. It was on the big screen. Oh, I got it. I'm seeing them in Atlanta. Uh, uh, November the 11th. I, I, I can't wait. I oh, that's really fantastic. You know that's what? Great. I'm gonna I'm running down for that one too. I'm so excited. Oh, are can... you gonna be in Atlanta? Yeah, yeah. I missed oh. him in Asheville. I couldn't. I was out of town. So, uh, you know, when when it was coming up, I looked at the schedule. So I'm gonna get down to Atlanta. World oh. Series and the Stones, Steve. Wow, you guys are making me feel like a like a schmuck. I I <laughs> I uh... lights every day, Johnny from Logan. <sighs> I know, I know, I know. Are you up in Boston? I'm up in Boston, Simon. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And the closest they they've come so far was Pittsburgh, and uh, uh-huh. I opted not to go to that one. And and Don, you know, Charlie, and now Steve Jordan's tech and I stay in touch. And and he said, you know, any show you want to come to, let me know. And and uh, I've just. What are you waiting oh. for? I know, I know, I know. Well, you know, now I I I'm, I'm the odd man out here. I got to really, I got to put better. my money where my Way mouth to keep is. Keep on you about this. I know. Well, I was just going to say about the. Um, couple of quick things about the uh, the hi-hat thing i've heard the same thing about keltner and then i've heard keltner say that he got it from levon helm oh. and and it's it seems to be one of these stories that has sort of taken on its its own life you know what i mean it's it's an interesting thing and i know at one point um charlie even you know i think he even said something like i to someone asked him about that and he said i don't even know what you're talking about you know <laughs> like wow. he he was like not even really acknowledging that he lifts off the four you know and um i but. did it you know i played with bobby keys we put a band bobby lived here in nashville and in yeah. 2011 uh in between stones tours he was just he's i don't know if, if you guys knew bobby or ever spent any time with him but you know he's just a complete <laughs> character to to yeah. say the very least yeah, and he was getting so frustrated. He'd come home and he'd lose his he'd lose his lungs. He was like, "I gotta play when I'm not on the road," you know. And so, a few of us guys in town, we put a band together and we went out. Um, Bobby Keys and the Suffering Bastards was what it was called, and it was just <laughs> and we just played all the songs he'd played on, you know, from the Wanderer, the Dion song when he was a teenager, right. all the way through John Lennon songs, and I mean everything. You know, his discography's incredible. You can just pick. yeah, but most of that stuff was Stone songs. And so when we were starting to play them, you know, it, it was pretty funny. I found myself, uh, you know, you do that. Everybody does the Charlie thing, the right hand up. Just, yeah. you know, if you're going to play bitch or shattered or, or, you know, anything, you just start doing it. Yeah. And it got to the point where I couldn't not do it. It's just the only way to play that, those tunes. Like I didn't, it just didn't feel right. And it wasn't, it's not about consciously trying to do Charlie. It's just, you're trying to do the song. Right. To make it feel right. And, and it's just, there's just no other way around it. It's a real, I, I don't know of anybody else who has such a simple thing. That's just completely, it, it's indelible. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's all, it's everywhere in that music right. is just that yeah. simple yeah. lift. And and he would be the first guy to sort of poo poo it and say, no, yeah. don't, don't focus on that. And I, I echo John's, uh, you know, uh, comment that, probably Charlie was almost embarrassed about point, you know, this being mm-hmm. pointed out. And of course, what, what I guess a lot of the younger viewers don't know was that Charlie's real footing was in jazz. Right. You know, that yeah. was his thing. He was a jazz drummer. And, and just by, I don't know, he was the only guy that the Stones ever worked with. He, he became this very influential uh, drummer, but outside of the Stones, he didn't do much, and and there are photos or YouTube's of him, you know, playing along with boogie woogie uh, bands and with other jazz drummers. And he was just out along for the ride, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, Greg, one of the great jazz drummers of his time. God, I mean, um, 
he, he, he expends about a thousand calories for every four bars. Charlie, <laughs> Charlie expends four, ca- you know, a thousand calories maybe every four shows when, when, when playing jazz. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. language. <laughs> yep. Yep. You know, that was Charlie. It was all if time. you guys I just... ever get a chance, check out this friend of ours, Tim Reese, the sax player. Oh, yeah. He asked Charlie to play on his jazz album. And mm-hmm. there's Charlie playing drum, organ trio with Larry Goldings playing B3 and kick and bass. Yeah. Him playing sax. And they play a swing version. If you just go on YouTube, YouTube, Tim Reese, Honky Tonk Woman, organ trio. And Charlie is just swinging like crazy. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I've got, to, I've got to check it out. I've heard that. I've heard yeah. about this. Yeah. Is Larry Golden, Golden who, Larry Golden plays with James Taylor? Yeah, he plays with yes. James Taylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Great went up and asked him on the plane. Yeah. He said, Charlie, I've got a jazz album I'm doing. Would you be into playing on a swing version of Honky Tonk Woman, Organ Trio? And Charlie went, I love Organ Trio. I'll play on some other stuff. Let's ask Keith. And they went back and they asked Keith. So Keith and Charlie are on this great Tim Reese album. There's a great story. Tim wrote about this and he exactly what greg said so he's he mentioned he works up the courage to ask charlie and charlie's like yeah i, I love organ trios yeah let, let's ask keith so he, they go down and they ask keith and he, I, I guess the story goes that a few minutes later um keith and ronnie come up to the front of the plane and go we're in you know oh ronnie uh, too yeah ronnie too well, i think two we, versions they did the keith it's called the keith version with guitar and then the organ trio but charlie's on both of them yeah yeah um, got somebody else joining. It says MacBook Air, so it it's going to be a mystery until we see their face. So hang All tight, right. gentlemen. And we are welcomed by Don McCauley. Hey! All right. Hey. All right. Welcome, Don, also known as MacBook Air. I'm going to rename you. <laughs> How are you? Good hey, to see Don. you, Don. Doing great. Hey, Thanks for joining. Anonymity Don. is key. I like up, <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, brother. What's up, Steve? How are you? Good to see you, man. Yeah, you too. You too. Don, say hello to Simon Kirk. Simon, hello. nice great to see you again. And you. Yeah, man. Yeah. I have to, I have to tell a quick Steve Gorman story slash Bobby Keys story. So this would have been, Don, I don't know. It might have been 2013, one of the shows, either like at the Echoplex or the maybe one of the Boston Garden shows. I bumped into Bobby backstage, and I'm honored to say I share the same birthday as him and Keith, December 18th. You have a so license. A, yeah, license to shit in the streets, you know. <laughs> but uh, Sagittarius, yeah. Keith's famous line, half man, half horse, license to shit in the street. But, uh, ah! I, I your to, your I, clean living, John, enabled Keith and Bobby to, to run as fast as they could. Like, you had to balance that out. So your sacrifice <laughs> is duly noted. <laughs> so I, I go up to Bobby and I reintroduce myself because we'd met a couple of times. And I, I said, I told him who I was. And I said, I'm a, I'm a friend of Charlie's and a, and a good friend of mine, Steve Gorman. And his, his reply was, Steve Gorman, that guy's a great drummer. And I, and I just thought, I told you about that, Steve. I think I texted you later, it, which I just thought was so great because it, not that he didn't acknowledge the fact that I was a friend of Charlie's. But when I mentioned Steve's name, he went, you had just started playing with him. And I think you had not long before that, you had texted me a picture of the back of your car you said these are my drums i'm on my way to my gig tonight with bobby keys and i'm like oh yeah. my god that's gonna be amazing you know yeah I you anyway. were a friend of dorothy's <laughs> of dor <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> uh, uh, anyway quick quick side note on that regard bobby would d- just everybody has bobby stories if you spent five minutes with him but the best was when he would be looking through his phone and he would find photos that he had put in there and forgot about, and he wasn't quite sure how to access them or anything, but, but he would, he would, he would find an old picture like a Polaroid. And then his son, Jesse would, would put it, you know, take a photo of a photo. So Bobby could show it to us, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. And he had pictures from like, you know, exile sessions and he had pictures from, you know, there, there was a photo of, of uh, Ringo and Keith Moon with both herring headphones at, uh, standing at two sets of congas and Bobby's in the background. And then we'd all say, what session is that? He'd go, hell, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he had, he had a lot of those stone, you know, he had photos of, of, of those, of the 70 sessions, you know, the legendary, whatever the, you know, the South of France stuff and they're murky yeah. as hell. And it was a bad camera and all that. But, um, 
But Bobby would, when we started playing together, he would never would tell me what to do or anything, but he would always laugh and say, just, it started with, well, well, man, you've been doing your homework. And I was like, how do I explain how, how much I know how to rip off Charlie Watts? I mean, like the (laughs) band, you know, like my band did a really good job of that, you know, (laughs) you have no idea. Like we, you know, I dropped out of college so I could go to stone school, basically. You know what I mean? <laughs> we were, you know, I, I had um, endless, you know, especially making our first record, you know, the first time really in a studio, those, those tracks, like we have a song on our first record that's essentially sway rewritten and getting in a studio and, and feeling a little in over my head. And then listening back, uh, I would get, at the same, I was concurrently relaxed and more uptight listening to Charlie's tracks in that setting. You know what I mean? It was just like, yeah, yeah. oh, that's all I got to do is that. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's so simple and so easy. And that started my, for for all the talk about Ringo's tracks or Bonham or for that matter, Neil Peart, Charlie, it, it, and all this stuff we're talking about, and the thing that always blows my mind is the the conventionally straight drummer, simple fills, blah, blah, blah. His drum tracks are as identifiable as any other drummer. True. If you just take the stems, if yeah. you just put on, mm-hmm. and not just to us, a bunch of drummers, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's 30 or 40 Stones tracks that a peripheral fan, if you just play the drum track, goes, oh, that's Honky Tonk Women, or, you know, mm-hmm. oh, that's Miss You, <laughs> that's Shattered, that's... It go, that, that's, uh, you know, paint it black there. I mean, there's such signature parts and, 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 you know, in live, as we said, you know, they were, they were, uh, they bumped the tempos live and it was all about the performance and the show and all that. But still, I, I'm always been blown away at how he's never talked about as such a phenomenal studio drummer and so artistic right, right. and so creative and musical. Definitely. Because, again, you know, lot, you know, he's the engine room on stage, but in the studio, man, what a, what the simplest, most creative little, I mean, the hi hat on Angie. I mean, it's all, it's all you need to hear. Yeah. Like that makes the song. Yeah. It's fucking unbelievable. That guy. Yeah. Well, you know, his style was, was not bombastic. It wasn't like Mooney or, or Bonzo. And of course you can mix and match. None of those drummers could have yeah. sat in Charlie's stall. Uh, because they they were just I think Ringo possibly could have you know if uh, Ringo could have subs subbed for Charlie for a couple of songs their styles were pretty similar uh, but no one other than Charlie and 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 I know uh, Steve is a perfect substitute for Charlie Steve not only is a chameleon I mean he can play any style but his roots are very simple and strong and sturdy with simple fills. And, and of course, he's had this relationship with Keith for nearly 30 years and they got out their friends. So mm-hmm. it seems it was the perfect uh, uh, substitute for Charlie to come in. And of course, the, I spoke with Ronnie a couple of days ago and they all thought Charlie was going to come back. You know, he'd had a recurrence of his um, the, the, the cancer was starting to come back. And he'd gone in for treatment. Uh, so they had no idea. And Charlie said, look, you've got to honour these 13 shows. We got all this crew, three hundred crew. We can't let them down. We can't let all the fans down. So get get Steve in. Um, uh, that was the first choice, and yeah. and uh, you know I think Steve is wonderful. And Greg, you saw them last week. Uh, how yeah, was it? I saw them last week at the SoFi here where the Rams play. And I'm I'm just thinking of another similarity between Steve and Charlie. The first time I met Steve Jordan, I was a huge fan of his playing on Letterman and the Steve Kahn Casa Loco records and all kinds of stuff. But we were doing this tribute to Buddy Rich at the record uh, at the uh, power station in New York City. And I said something like, you should meet me over here. And he said, well, I don't. I don't have a driver's license. I don't drive. And I went, <laughs> Jordan doesn't have a driver's license. And here you are in the car with Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Telling yeah. Ronnie he doesn't boom, drive. Boom, 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 boom. Like, oh. Wow. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. And I, I think I heard, Don, you might know better, but I think I'd heard they met way back in 78 when the Stones did Saturday Night Live and Steve was the house drummer in the, yes. in the, in the SNL band at the time. And Charlie really dug his playing and, and they sort of connected there and then through the years, like I think when it came, to, I think, as you said, Simon, or, or someone mentioned that when when Keith went to do the first Winos record, Charlie said, you should get that guy, Steve Jordan. Yeah, yeah great. that was the conversation. Yeah, that was the conversation, Steve. 
uh, had a lot, you know, coming into this was that he had already met him way back. They had already had a major relationship. And, um, and of, of course, throughout the years, you know, coming in on recording sessions and things like that, he's, uh, he's been around, he's been yeah. around, you know, and, uh, and trusted that he can, he can hold his own, you he know, sure halfway, great- three, three quarters of the way through the night, you know? Yeah. He sure so. did a great job at the concert last week, man. It was such yeah. a... Which one did you go to? Did you go to the first or second? Uh, Tim Reese got uh, my kids and I tickets to the SoFi, one of the SoFi shows in, in L.A. Was it the first one or second one? Do you know? It was the second, I think. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That was a that was a great show. Oh, first one was God. great, but the second one really had something special. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. God, so great. Yeah. I think you've got this sort of perfect storm of a rejuvenated band because, you know, Steve is, I believe, uh, He's only 60 in his early 60s, very fit. So he's, you know, giving them a little bit of extra muscle. You've got this uh, affection uh, and uh, for Charlie and and everyone in that stadium, uh, you know, misses him. And and then you've got the fact that the Stones are out there on stage doing it, you know, for Charlie and and honouring Charlie. It's a one, I I can't wait to see them. I really can't because I know I'm going to shed tears when they have the, the tribute because I loved him so much and, and it was came as such a shock. And Ronnie told me no one was allowed, you know, because of the COVID restrictions, no one could go to England to, for the funeral. And that absolutely tore all of them up, particularly Keith. And Keith can still not speak to um, a great length about Charlie still to this day, because he was so, uh, he loved Charlie so much. And the fact that they couldn't go and say goodbye to their pal. And when, when Chooch died, they all downed tools and flew to Michigan, all of them, uh, right. on, the, the, on the on a private plane to bury Chooch. That's what how tight knit a band they were that they would honor their crew because mm-hmm. Chooch had been with them for you know, decades. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it tore them up that they couldn't say goodbye to Charlie. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. That was a tough, that. tough day. Tough, tough yeah. news yeah. to get, you know? Yeah. But, uh, you know. Uh, it's, you know, it's uh, interesting. Like, just it, the number of conversations I'm sure we've all had. Um, there was just this general, almost like a conventional wisdom of, oh, they'll probably, this will probably be the end of the Stones. And I, I just thought that's the exact, I mean, there's no way. That's like. Like you said, uh, Simon, you talk about a rejuvenation, a, a, a recommitment to now honoring Charlie. Mm. Like every time they take that stage, it's a it's a testament to what Charlie Watts brought to that band, and that's not. Um, and and obviously that's coming from Steve, but to to those to the other guys, it's like that you couldn't drag them away now. That's just not possible, you know. I mean, it's like it is a, you know, it's like that. It's like an athlete, like you know, you retire. Like I'm gonna pull the plug, and then you lose your last game, and you're like, maybe I got another season in me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, you know, they, they would always Those look are gonna to go Charlie. out on Stone's terms. They would always right. look to Charlie when it came to touring, and Ronnie told me this that that Charlie, number one, being the oldest, and as we know, uh, the last year of his life, he wasn't the most healthy guy. They would call up Charlie and say, "Listen, Charlie, um, we're thinking of going out next year. What do you say?" And Charlie would give the thumbs up. But now that Charlie's no longer around, yeah, I think you're right, Steve. I think you're going to see the Stones for another few years. They'll probably do another world tour. Uh, it's it's not beyond the bounds of possibility. I, I have to go because I got an appointment in a few minutes, but I want to leave you with this great Charlie story. Yes, I went please. to see them a few years ago um, in uh, Philadelphia. And... Um, they took me, you know, all through the backstage, la, la, past all the. I said hello to Ronnie in this wonderful dressing room with weed smoke and shit and fucking reggae playing and, <laughs> and five star meals. But then you go to Keith's yeah. dressing room and it's even more palatial and he's got speakers coming out that, you know, and everyone's like grooving. In fact, <laughs> and Keith said to me, there were so many people in his dressing room. He says, you know, Simon, I can't wait to go out on stage in front of 80,000 people for some peace and quiet. <laughs> yeah. but then, oh, so then they show me the charlie's and charlie's dressing room is like you know where they keep the brooms 
<laughs> backstage in arenas. This was Charlie's dressing room. It was tiny. It was like a cell. And he had, listen to this, drummers will appreciate this. He had a little practice pad with a pair of sticks on a small table and in um, and an orchid, and an orchid, one orchid on the table and a little glass of water. Ah. Oh. <laughs> and um, he was doing, you know, practice. There it is. Look at that. Yeah. Practicing paradiddles. And I said, Charlie. How are you, mate? He says, I'm fine, Simon. He says, oh, yeah, you're not drinking anymore. I said, nah. He said, would you like a glass of Perrier water? I said, thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much. So he goes and gets a Perrier. He, he doesn't drink, you know. He, so me and him have a little clink our glasses. And then from next door, we hear this, la, 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 la. La, 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 la. <laughs> so what the fuck's that? He says, oh, Mick, he's just got this bloody vocal instructor from the Royal opera house in london and he's on the road with us and that's all i hear before i go on stage la 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 la, la. so we sat there me and him and i'm just getting a little teary just thinking of that that, oh, that moment because that was the charlie i i really loved and um i'll, I'll never forget him he was he was one of a kind that's he so was beautiful. quite he was quite fond of you as well. I know that for oh, sure. He you. really was. Yeah, he talked about you quite a bit. With, you know, straight ahead rock and roll drummer, but he swings like nobody, none of those other guys. Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. Yes. I, wow. From one swinging rocker to another, I, and you know, I was going to say, yeah. I know you have to run, Simon, but I think it's so cool that you have that memory because I, I, I think about the history that you guys have. You know, like fifty odd plus years. You know, of of yeah. so to sort of be in that situation where you're both drinking your Perrier and, you know, and there's Mick doing his vocal warm-ups. It's kind of like, you know, here we are now, you know? <laughs> yeah. And the, the, the unspoken word was singers. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, gentlemen, I have to leave you. John, uh, we'll do a one-on-one -on -one soon. I look Greg, forward. lovely to see you, brother. And you too, Steve, son. And you, Don. Give it was well. Love, everyone. Great to see you. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you, John. All the Go best back. to you. See you soon. Yep. Bye-bye. Johnny, wow. can I tell my story about uh, the Tony Williams lessons thing with Charlie? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you guys might have heard this, but my friend Tim Reese, who's playing sax, as you know, uh, he tells Charlie that his buddy from Maynard's band has been taking lessons with Tony Williams. And now all of a sudden, Charlie, being the jazz aficionado that he is, he says, I want to talk to him about that. You know, so... He arranges it, uh, I think it was, oh gosh, I can't remember the year, but it was at the Mighty Duck Forum in Anaheim. Any idea what year that, like oui. maybe 10 years ago? Uh, well, sounds familiar, but who knows? Yeah, yeah. but anyway, there's there's Charlie and he's, Tim says, this is my friend Greg who, you know, took lessons with, and he says, what was it like taking lessons with Tony Williams. And I started to tell him, and I'm at, I'm, I'm saying we, we used to play double drums. We talked about grip. We talked about everything being from the ride cymbal and how when he got with Miles, he was 17 and he was too young to be nervous. It's not till you get a little older that you get nervous. And how we'd look out at the audience and he'd try to blip, 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 play a lick. And I started getting really into it. And then Steve Ferroni comes out of the right-hand corner. Charlie, what's that? And my whole story's went... The kajoots right there. I, was oh. like, oh, I can't finish my story. Thanks a lot, Steve Ferroni. No, I love Steve. But I wanted to just tell Charlie so much about it because he was so into it. He just wanted to know so much about Tony and yeah. Elvin and Roy Haynes and Philly Joe and, you know, Max Roach. That's what he really played drums for, man. Yeah, absolutely. Don, I, I know you, you have a comment. I was just going to say, I... I went into great detail in the last one of these we did. So I won't, I won't go over, you know, on and on about it, but he, um, he, I think what, what allowed me to sort of be led into his orbit was the fact that I, you know, all those guys were still alive when I met Charlie and, and he knew that I knew them and not, I, I think he liked me too. <laughs> I don't think it was just that, but, but the Everybody fact that, likes you, well, <laughs> but the fact that I, I had this sort of, you know, connection to Elvin and to Tony. Uh, I knew Max a little bit, you know, Louis Belson, and, and we would talk a lot about those guys. And, 
And he was, it, it, it just, it used to blow my mind when we have some of these, when we'd have time to actually have a conversation and he'd talk about seeing some of these guys or listening to him when he was younger. And there was this, I'll, I'll shorten this story, I promise very much, but we were on a, we were had lunch together in London in 2008. And we went off and did a bunch of these um, errands that he had to run. And he was introducing me to these people, uh, that, like the guy that makes his custom shirts and makes his custom shoes as an important man in the music business who knows Roy <laughs> Haynes and Elvin Jones and all these famous drummers. And, and, and the guys, you know, the guys in the shops are looking at me like, like, wow wow, that's really great. And I'm thinking, yeah, but I'm here with Charlie Watts right now. You know, like those guys, yeah, they're, yeah. But he's like, this man's, he's a very important man in the music business. So it was just, <laughs> it was a really incredible day. Can anyway. that stick? Can that be part of your whole moniker? A very important man in the music business. Oh, it already is. It already, it already is. is. Well, <laughs> <It's a stable. laughs> anyway, no. He would he would let you into his world, you know. He he would invite you into his world if he likes you, if he was interested in what you had to do, you know, what you were all about. And um, that was that was for sure. And you'd see it, you know. He'd have his, you know, he'd be drab all day, just like oh, I gotta go through this whole massive touring and all this stuff and travel. Yeah. But as soon as you start talking about something of interest, like jazz, or let's go to Motown Museum, or let's go do something, or so and so is coming by, or or Tony Williams, like. A conversation like that he had this glimmer in his eye that just lit up that sort of like glazing at something this bar of gold you know wow. and uh, and then it, he'd reveal himself don have you seen this rob shanahan photo i have yeah i saw rob last night actually in the crowd with hillary oh. and, uh, and 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 he was just in he was in keith's pit he was looking right up and he was in you know he had lunch i think with steve as well yeah. and of course yeah of course he's taking a picture <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well i thought rob was going to join us today but i i, yeah, I, I saw something came up i don't must, must have got stuck yeah. in minneapolis oh yeah. minneapolis when His I was down. Yeah. charlie hadn't played a rolling kit before and he was going oh, right yeah. i saw that and ringo gave him the sticks and he's looking down like all right and then there's a video of him playing and having fun with it too i don't know if you've seen that i have and i have that image right there on rob gave it to me on a small um a small little hanging and i love the idea that you're seeing them exchange sticks. Maybe it's oh yeah, the but they're but they're back and forth. You know, you're the butt end of the stick, and then the and then the yeah. eight on the butt. And it's like no, you take it. No, you take oh. it. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's I'm really mad. beautiful. Yeah. You know, I have a picture Rob gave me right after that was taken. I'll, I'm gonna get it. Hold on. How much longer are you out for, Don? Um, we are. We just added another date. We just got to Florida, and we go come back to Florida at the Seminole Hard Rock uh, the day before, two days before Thanksgiving. Wow, very good. But then, of course, next two weeks from that, I'm wrapped up and going to doing stuff related to it. But Man. yeah, we're out for a little while. We've been out for a while. It's been, you know. Where's the date you added, Don? What town? Which... It's in Hollywood, Florida. Hollywood. Florida. The... That's yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So this is, this is from that same day at Ringo's house. That's great. And, uh, Last week, I was talking to Keltner. I was hoping he could join us today, but it's going to be a different day that Keltner's on this. And as I'm talking to him from right here, I'm looking at this picture. And I said, I'm looking at this amazing picture of you and Charlie and Ringo that Rob sent me. And he said, you know, Jim, he, he's just such a sweetheart and such a humble guy. I said, oh, man, that was an incredible day. He said, I, I, I still and this is Jim Keltner saying this. He said, I still have to pinch myself that I, I somehow. I don't know how I, I met these two guys. We were all about 30 years old at the time and, and uh, became friends. And, and they, you know, he's like, we're talking about the two greatest rock and roll drummers ever. And somehow they let me in their world. And, and we, you know, we're friends till the end. And, and, uh, and he, he got a little choked up. We've spoken a few times and he got choked up talking about Charlie. And, and uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's amazing that that I'm just so happy that that was captured. You know, that day was oh. captured by Rob. You know, you know, Johnny Ringo has a story about being at a party. I don't know if it was at Ringo's house or at Charlie's house years ago, and Bonham was playing on the drum kit, 
and it, the bass drum was just sliding. And there's Nico <laughs> and Charlie holding back, holding the bass drum. Yeah. And John's just playing, and it's sliding. Oh Don, did God. Charlie ever talk about that? I've, I've heard about that, yeah. <laughs> what does he say about his recollection? Big fucking bass drum. Yeah, <laughs> was that at Bonham's house? I, I have no idea about that, but uh, but I did. He did tell me about you know his interaction with John Bonham. Uh, he's like, oh yeah, you know and that rock and roll thing, you know. And we got, of course, we got Charles Connor to come out, uh, the oh, original, yeah. you know, original guy who wrote that part, right? Yeah. And um, so that was a big conversation about John Bonham, and you know, did he get it right? Oh. Uh, yeah, it was pretty wild. Wow. And Charles Connor is teaching Keltner, myself, and Charlie. The, the train the train beat but the train swing yeah which which little richard brought him down to the train station and said play he was telling us the story ah. he's from louisiana and he's like yeah. we're all just like tuned right in it was incredible wow. but uh yeah he took you know a lot of conversation about john bottom that day That's and jim and jim jim had a much more in-depth relationship with him you know than yeah, yeah 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 I, I was just going to say, Steve, I, I, I remember I've, I've talked to you about this a whole bunch of times, I know, but I remember when the Black Crows, when you guys did that tour with the Stones in Europe and uh, I hadn't met Charlie yet. And I was just so like excited for you. And I, I remember you telling me like when you when you all the internal strife aside that was happening in the band in those days, when you when you guys we're all together and saw them. It like gave you like a whole new lease on life in terms of how you viewed the black crows. Like you went like, okay, guys, like this is the real shit right here. And like all yeah, of we had petty- a, And for about three months, it really meant something to us, but uh, you know, things fall apart as they do, but no, <laughs> yeah. in, but as that was happening. Yeah. Like I said earlier, just, just being able to stand right behind them for a set behind that scrim. Um, yeah, my I took more than just his playing from it. It really was the he and Keith's connection. Yeah. You know, they were playing Monkey Man, and Keith was just standing. He just stared at Charlie the whole time. And so, you know, Keith is three feet in front of Charlie, and I'm five feet behind Charlie, and I'm just watching those two guys for four wow. minutes locked in. And it was, you know, and it was so intense. At some point, I'm like, I'm thinking, is this shtick? <laughs> like, what, what is Keith doing? Like, is he taking a mental break? Like, he's got his back to the crowd. But he was just so d- digging into Charlie. You know, he was just, like, floating on Charlie's water. You know what I mean? That's what he's doing. And it, and to see it up close, it was – it it took away a lot of my um, – or, or, or it, I took from that that I need to remove an awful lot of – up to that moment, I didn't realize how much ego or different, you know, things in my playing. It's like, it's that, if you find that connection, you lock in, you hold on to it for dear life, you know, in the moment. Yeah. And, you know, you can never, any musician, you, you don't stop learning. You don't stop being reminded of what you're there to do. But man, that lesson was hardcore. I mean, it, it hit me like a, like a, a bat to the head, you know? And, um, that um, I, I mean, I look back now and I have for years with a little bit of regret. But at the time, like I, I said hi to Charlie a few times, you know, we'd chat for just a minute. But I was well aware of the fact that if I start a conversation with him, he's going to have me removed from the room. <laughs> like, I don't know about that. If, if I pop this cork, man, it's going to get bad. You know, he's going to be like <laughs> nice for a minute and then he's going to give that little look to somebody and I'm going to be a stick out you. older. Yeah. Don, uh, when did, Don, when did you first start working with Charlie? Uh, for the 50th anniversary 2012 tour. 12. And uh, yeah, yeah. And I, my, I was just thinking about what, what Steve was saying about the space between Keith and Charlie. And my very first day, knowing about the being involved with the Stones, I started a couple of years earlier with me and Pierre de Beauport, Keith Richards guy, uh, playing music together and living in the same town area. And uh, so he had kind of told me about it. But on day one, he put me between the two of those guys in a chair, sat there for two fucking hours and saw them, saw the space between them and saw the heat that was happening between that. It's unbelievable. That is the connection, the connection. And it is right now with Steve as well, with Keith, of course. But that 
um, on day one, that was, it does hit you over the head and it knocks you out. It changes, it changes your life to, did as a Charlie, drummer. Yeah. Did Charlie count off all the songs and get the tempos? And does Steve do that now? Or would Keith ever start the tempos? How does that, how does that go down with starting the song? Oh, it's territorial. Yeah. <laughs> it's territorial. Lavall, I mean, right? there's, Keith, Keith starts to some of his stuff. Of course, Chuck Laval does a fantastic job of keeping everybody wrangled yeah. together. Honky Tonk Woman Cowbell, right? Right. Well, yeah, even and then counting off, you know, he's got yeah. he's got everything. He's got the books and he's done a lot of studying. And uh, and Steve, of course, now, too, is starting some songs because he's feeling it from from the center. You know, And did Charlie do that, too? Did Charlie start some songs? on? You know, get off my cloud, things like that, which, of course, are, he's going to set the tempo. He's going to feel yeah. maybe a few. But yeah, you also got to understand at rehearsals that run through 80, 90 songs. Yeah. over five weeks you know three four or five weeks yeah and they'll just do like 25 or 30 for the for the tour you know yeah but they go through a lot of songs so they'll start you know oh yeah you always used to start that off so why don't you start it off again uh -huh. and they'll That's try that and if it doesn't yeah. work chuck's like i got you back you know uh -huh. chuck is there for you so it's pretty rapid it's pretty fast because Ringo doesn't like counting off songs. Paul always counted the songs sure. off, so he'd rather not have to count it off. It's kind of a lot of pressure. It's yes, a lot of pressure. It is. Yeah. <laughs> if you want it to be the right tempo. Yeah. Right. What's more important, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, no. it's, you know, you have that decision of, do I want the pressure or do I want to be mad for the next four minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It, it it's a balancing wrestling. act at all times. Would you like me to start this too fast or too slow? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, Steve, you were saying like when you guys played with them in the 90s, you know, they definitely, you know, the, a lot of the tunes were, were amped up. There was definitely more more up tempo. And I I think as time went on and maybe it was Chuck Laval's influence on the band that they really seemed to dial that in much tighter. I know that when I started to go to all these shows in the late 90s, like I'd be at, at sound checks and, you know, being at a few of them. And uh, and I, I don't want to say anything out of school, but I, I would I would hear Mick comment on like if they did tumbling dice at a sound check and he'd say it, it seemed it seemed a little fast you know can we can we try it again you know and, and it's and and charlie once said to me just we were we were talking about tempos and it was when i started playing again and i was telling him i'm having a real i'm just so fixated now on tempos that i i, I make myself crazy with it you know and and he said something like he said Keith, you know, Keith, as long as long as the tempo is close, Keith is happy. But Mick, Mick seems to be a little more fixated on, yeah. on it being really. And I guess as the singer, that makes sense. But mm -hmm. but I remember we had this sort of like drummer to drummer sort of commiseration about tempos. And he said, as, as long as it's sort of in the zone, Keith, Keith is, you know, he'll he'll make it work, you know, yeah. and they can they can get their mojo going. But uh, well, I mean, so, it's it's a it's incredible to recognize i mean you said earlier don was it the first or second show in la oh that second one was special you know it's still a living breathing real band and, all the way through all and, the way through every every single time they play together it's uh you know they make they make the they make the most of that tempo or that five yeah. they'll run with it they'll just run with it because they know the song is the song yeah. the tempo as long as it's moving I mean, it's a lot like jazz, of course. So you got to, as long as it's moving forward, and if it's not too slow, for, for Mick, everybody else can play the parts yeah. very, very, very easily. I, I, I'm laughing because I remember the I, the last show I saw was in 2015 here in Nashville. and yeah, Remember that. And, uh, and um, I was, I'm standing at the soundboard with my son. He'd never seen them before. He was 15 at the time. And... And they, they were, they had a great night. It was just, it was fantastic. And Chuck had told me, Chuck had actually, Chuck Lavelle had come on my radio show the day before and we're on air and he said, oh man, everyone's, it's so locked in. It's great. It's great. It's great. And we hit the commercial break. And I said, so how is it really? You know, just because, you know, you gotta, he goes, no, no, I'm not making it up. No, it's like, he goes, man, Woody is in amazing shape and he's pushing Keith now and their interplay is, you know, and we had this, so I was excited to see it even more so. But I was watching that show that night and every time a song would start, it would fall in and and, you know, you can't help but compare it to 72, 70. You know, you're thinking about all the different times you, every version I've ever heard of these songs played live. And there were moments when you would hear it within the first eight, 12 bars. All of a sudden it's like, oh, they found the gear and there it is. And it stayed. Yeah. And it was it was mind blowing to me. 
And then on top of it, like you just said, the songs are the songs. And then I'd go, God damn, they got good songs. This band's yeah. really, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's I know, like yeah. but I was like, that's actually the same people. That's the, yeah. those guys made sticky fingers and they're still here. I mean, it, it's yeah. just overwhelming at times. Um, they know their songs. They know their songs very, very well, you know? Yeah. Like, like Keith is always listening and, and studying. I mean, they, they definitely are extremely hardworking. When it comes down to X and yeah. it's a, it's a job. And Char- that's the one thing about Charlie too, that I think he, I think everybody knows is that he was there. He's, he was working. He was the only guy really, he was, he was the only guy really, working. you know, he was, he's always been the working drummer from day one. Yeah. So, yeah. Don, I got to tell you, your sound out front, man. I don't, I'm not sure who your house front guy is. He's probably been there a long time, but Dave Natal. love what's his name? Dave Natal. He's he's yeah, he's the best. He's also a drummer. He's also a drummer. Oh, and he, so he's yeah. been drumming. He was drumming before he was mixing sound. And he, uh, analog analog 100 percent and nothing no i didn't know what that stadium is four billion dollar huge football in and out stadium indoor too big yeah it sounded like a record way in the back yeah. it was so perfect you could hear everything <laughs> funny, but you could hear everything because when mick came back and played the maracas though the maracas got a lot louder <laughs> yeah oh, yeah Mix the money <laughs> it's a huge part of the band too a huge part of the sound yeah. maracas yeah yeah man Wow. Well, guys, I, you know, we could, we could, we could go on all night and, and uh, we could, we could. I so appreciate you guys doing this today and joining me and Don, thank you for, I know you just landed in Tampa and, and right, thanks for just, landed in, just coming over. And just woke up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you guys so much. Steve Gorman, Greg Vissonette, Don McCauley, Simon Kirk, who was here earlier. You guys are the best. Love you guys. Um, any final it's thoughts good. before I, I shut us down. I, I do. I, I have one. I can't wait to get into that room. I do. I have one. I can't wait to get into that room. Yeah, I can't and wait to have you in this room. Check it. Check out your drums. Yeah, do some trading eights. Yeah. 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 Or in Can my case, like eight. seven and a half. Seven and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I've always right said, I, 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 when I when I get there, I'm I'm playing lefty by guy. I'm not leaving that room until I figure it out either. So all right, Steve. right. We're gonna need some water, cup, some snacks. I got some work to do. You know it. And <laughs> the other room, I have plenty of right-handed drum sets set up just for you guys too. So now, as a wonderful husband, are you going to have Zildjian sticks for us or Vic Firth sticks for us? Uh, I, uh-huh. I I I have pretty much all Vic Firth sticks <laughs> for us. <laughs> <laughs> Zildjian sticks, you know, they're 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 made by Vic Firth, you know. But I I know that was a long time ago. So now I, I, use, I use the real things. So. <laughs> Greg, we'll tell that story another time. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. Guys, hang tight for well, one second. I, I will say so this. Much. I will say this. For what it's worth, um, you know, like everybody, when I saw the news, uh, John and Don, you're the first two guys I thought of. And I I just, you know, I, we, we've, John, you and I have talked plenty uh, privately, but, you know, it's just uh, the, the, Loss that everybody feels having this appreciation that was always there, but now is so honed and sharp. It seems, um, you know, I, I, it, you guys have a special. I thought a lot about you since, and um, I'm happy to see both of you. And uh, you I'm going to see you in Atlanta in a couple weeks. And uh, great, oh great. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know. It's a, it's, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I, I've thought about you guys a lot. I know it's a, it's a very it, much more than I felt, you know, a personal one. So my condolences. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I, and I appreciate you reaching out when you did. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Look forward to seeing you. And Greg, um, as, as, Greg, as per usual, my thoughts with you are just, you know, this has been more than enough time. And, uh, <laughs> You know, Pearl that's are always great. You know what I mean? Those those first three, four minutes with Greg are always a joy. You know, man. <laughs> play it out. We'll play, do some play out music. Oh. We love you. Yeah. Love you guys too. Thank you guys so much. This has been so great. Steve Gorman, Greg Bissonette, Don McCauley. Thank you guys. 
Cheers, guys. I'll see you guys soon. See ya. Hey, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.